Should Sprigatito stand up? I've witnessed this conversation multiple times since the reveal of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. It's pretty pervasive to the point that I've participated in this discussion three times already with the same group of people. <laughs> Way to call them out. <laughs> You probably have your opinions ready to go, and you may as well be writing them into the comments right now, and don't let me stop you, but I don't think this is a simple question of preferences. I think the question of whether it's okay for Sprigatito to evolve into a bipedal creature is ultimately a question about what makes a successful starter Pokémon, both individually and as a set. I'm framing this around Sprigatito, but this video is really about starters in general. So even if you're watching this in the future at a point when we already know what the Gen 9 starters evolve into, you can still get plenty out of it. There are two aspects we need to look at. Intention, or what Game Freak wants starter Pokémon to be, and Precedent, or what starter Pokémon have actually been in the past. Let's start with Intention, because we actually have a decent amount of information about what Game Freak thinks about starter Pokémon thanks to an interview with Pokémon designers Ken Sugimori, Takao Uno, and Yusuke Omura that was published by Nintendo Dream in 2011. The translation was published in 2019 by Dr. Lava. In the interview, Sugimori, Uno, and Omura discussed the process of designing the Unovan starters, and they mentioned a few key principles to starter design. Number one, starter Pokémon should not resemble any existing Pokémon. Starter Pokémon are special, and so they should look it. This is kind of a freebie principle, I don't think any starters fail this criteria. Number two, they should be inspired by animals that are familiar to everybody. Very few starters fall outside of this, but even the ones that do are still familiar enough. For example, I'm not sure many people would recognize Cyndaquil, like, is it an echidna or a ferret or a badger? But it's enough of a generic cute mammal that it passes as a natural creature. Number three, the inspirations and themes need to fit with their elemental types, and they need to be well integrated into the concept and the design. This is definitely a principle they've occasionally failed to follow. I find it kind of funny that Uno specifically says that a dog with leaves growing out of it wouldn't be a good starter design, when a lot of the early grass type starters are just an Animal with leaves growing out of it. Number four, evolutions need to offer something new to the family. They need to be clever progressions. For example, Totodile into Feraligatr isn't great on this count because it pretty much just gets bigger and more detailed, but Torchic into Blaziken manages to feel fresh and unexpected without being dissonant. And number five, each starter in a set needs to have a unique role. The first stages all more or less correspond to a serious one, a cool one, and a funny one, but the evolved forms have that division of roles too, like how in Gen 6 they were all different RPG character classes. Now, the interview is from the Gen 5 era, so it's probably not representative of starter design philosophy throughout the entire history of the franchise. Some of these principles probably weren't around from the beginning, some priorities might have changed over time, and they probably have newer guiding principles nowadays. But since Gen 5 is currently the midpoint of the franchise, roughly, I think this captures about as much as we could hope for. There are two more criteria that I want to add that the Pokémon designers didn't mention, but that I'm pretty sure have been part of their process from the beginning. Number six, starters need to have broad appeal. Every fan should love at least one starter from each set, and I think in an ideal situation, fan preferences would be evenly split across all three. Hey, that's me for this generation. <laughs> there you go! And number seven, they have to be powerful and interesting enough to use that they deserve that key spot on your team. You don't want players to regret their starter pick because of a more exciting Pokémon that they encounter later. I think these seven principles give us a pretty solid and somewhat objective metric to evaluate starters, and it gives us a sense of what Game Freak thinks makes a successful starter Pokémon. But the theory isn't all there is to it, so now we can look at precedent, at what the starter Pokémon actually were. The original Kanto starters laid the foundation for and defined the basic principles of what starter Pokémon are, and every set of starters since then has built upon and refined that definition. Because starter Pokémon are so prominent, I suspect which game you started with has an effect on your expectations for future starter Pokémon. If your first game was Sun and Moon, you probably didn't have much baggage about Bulbasaur, Charmander, and Squirtle when making your choice between Rowlet, Litten, and Poplio. It's a same for Pokémon in general, but starters are a very special and specific subset, so I think it's important to acknowledge that. 
That being said, the franchise's understanding of starter Pokémon definitely begins with Bulbasaur, Charmander, and Squirtle, and so does mine, so that's going to be our baseline. These three are a bit simple, but otherwise pretty successful starters by Game Freak standards, and not just because they were the first. All three lines progress very well. Bulbasaur into Ivysaur and Venusaur in particular shows great progression with the Blooming Flower, but all three of them grow from cute into powerful, which is a very successful progression. The motifs don't all integrate super well with the design. A fire-breathing dragon is perfect, but Bulbasaur is pretty much just a monster with a plant on its back. And Squirtle doesn't show any waterness to its design aside from being a terrapin. But having no precedent and within the context of Generation 1, they all work well enough. All three lines are based on reptile-esque creatures. Venusaur might be more of a frog, but close enough. But they have great variety in their body types and their playstyles, with an offensive one, a defensive one, and a disruptive one with status conditions and healing. That means you probably like at least one of these starters, whatever your preferences may be. Venusaur and Charizard also have secondary types, although only Charizard's really makes it special since Almost every Kanto grass type is also poison. And within the context of Generation 1, you're unlikely to come across more interesting Pokémon of those types. If you play Pokémon Yellow, you have to deliberately choose to not end up with all three on your team. In Gen 2, Chikorita, Totodile, and Cyndaquil try to build on the success of their predecessors, but unfortunately, they don't quite get there. All of the first sages are brilliant, and all of the middle stages develop those ideas and add something new, but then all of the final evolutions revert those changes and end up kind of bland. Meganium doesn't have the leaf blade on its head, Typhlosion goes back to having only one fiery patch instead of two, and Feraligator loses the caveman motif from Croconaw. All three end up being pretty much just creature plus type, not very well integrated. Feraligator, like Blastoise and a lot of later water type starters too, is just a blue creature with an aquatic inspiration. There's nothing inherently water type about its design. They do offer more variety in the animals that they are based on. We have our first mammal, and they do still have decent variety in their body types types, but their utility isn't as good. Meganium is pretty defensive, but it doesn't have a moveset that supports that well enough. Typhlosion is just Charizard again, but without the flying type. In fact, none of them have secondary types, so they all end up feeling pretty basic. I think you'd still be pretty hard-pressed to replace your starter with something more interesting, and I love every Johto starter that isn't Meganium, but I think they might end up being among the least successful starters as a set. Not so for Generation 3. I always have trouble choosing between Trico, Torchic, and Mudkip because they're all amazing! All three of these lines are extremely well-loved, and for good reason. All three develop really nicely as they evolve. Sceptile and Swampert aren't quite as unexpected as Blaziken, but they still build on the earlier stages in interesting ways. They all go from cute to looking cool and powerful. Once again, their body styles have become less varied, and so have their play styles, although they are still all unique. Sceptile is a fast special attacker, Blaziken is a great mixed attacker, and Swampert has balanced enough stats and a good enough moveset to be very versatile. Blaziken and Swampert also gain cool secondary types, but for some reason Sceptile is left out, which to me makes it the least interesting choice by a slim margin. I think Gen 4 does even better at making a great set of starters with Turtwig, Chimchar, and Piplup, even though I'm not as huge a fan of any of them. Their progressions are amazing, and their concepts are better integrated with their types than any previous generation. They all go from simple animal with type to their ultimate forms. The World Turtle, the Monkey King Sun Wukong, the Emperor Penguin that is also an actual emperor. This gives the set a coherent theme for the first time. The type and concept combo works best in the Turtwig family, I think, where a little twig grows into a couple of bushes, and then into a whole landscape, mountains and everything. The animals that inspires them, their body shapes, and even their secondary types are incredibly varied, so you're bound to like at least one of them. Unfortunately, though, Infernape repeats Blaziken's fire and fighting type combo, and it's also a mixed attacker, just it's faster this time, so that makes it feel less special. Empoleon also has a very similar stat spread to Blastoise, but the new Steel type and three generations of separation 
help it avoid that feeling of repetition. In Gen 5, Snivy, Tepig, and Oshawott once again make up a great set of starters. I think it's one of the best sets, but it's also pretty controversial. Like, personally, I hate Servine, and it casts a shadow of distaste across the rest of the family. And it's also pretty easy to find people who dislike the Oshawott and Tepig families for various reasons. The degenerates. They like Tepig. <laughs> and I like them. <laughs> Once again, all three have a shared theme, multicultural military styles, and they all have great growth patterns throughout their evolutions, at least if you can pretend that Servine doesn't exist, and if you can accept that an otter evolves into something based on sea lions. The Oshawott family is actually the first water-type starter that has actual concrete references to water in their designs beyond just the colors and the basic creature. The seashell motif really helps to sell that these are water types, which is awesome. They have so much variety in their body types, plus they all change stances as they evolve. You have your standard quadruped that becomes a biped, but you also have the opposite, a biped that becomes a quadruped, and you even have a biped that becomes a noped. It's my favorite thing about them as a set. We go back to pure grass and water types, but for some reason it's not the same with fire. Ambor is the third firefighting starter in a row, and once again, it's a mixed attacker, only this time it's slower than Blaziken. I love Ambor, but this is definitely too repetitive. It makes it harder for these Pokémon to shine. At least Gen 5 introduces a new element that helps starters stand out more. Hidden abilities. Whereas every starter shares essentially the same ability, just focused on different types, hidden abilities let them be more unique, at least in competitive settings, since you can't have a hidden ability starter at the beginning of the game. But seeing starters be competitively relevant is super cool, and Superior was the first one to really benefit from this with Contrary. Gen 6 offers another great set with Chespin, Fennekin, and Froakie. They have great new type combinations and awesome progression in most cases. I say in most cases because I don't think that Delphox was very well executed, even if the idea to go from a fox to a young witch to a proper mage was good. They have unique playstyles, and this time they even get signature moves that help to highlight their individual playstyles. And of course, Greninja's hidden ability is amazing. Where the Gen 6 starters falter a bit, is in their body type variety, since they all start to lean more humanoid, and they all end up bipedal. This makes perfect sense with their RPG theme, but it also means that Gen 6 doesn't offer that more animalistic option. Starters begin to shift more into being roles or personalities rather than creatures. More pal than pet. The themes are getting tighter. And Gen 7 continues this trend. Once again, Rowlet, Litten, and Poplio are a really solid set. Rowlet is a perfect Pokémon, and Decidueye is my favorite fully evolved starter, so I may be a bit biased. But the Gen 7 starters still have secondary types, they still have a solid theme, and they still have great family progression, even if I think Incineroar looks a little bit more goofy than what felt appropriate to follow Litten and Tauracat. All three are fairly offense-oriented, but you do have the dedicated special attacker, the balanced mixed attacker, and the disruptive physical attacker, so there is some variety. All three get cool signature moves and interesting hidden abilities, although of course Incineroar has been the most successful one competitively. Something the Gen 7 starters got that the Gen 6 ones didn't was access to the gimmick of the generation with signature Z-moves. This shows that the Pokémon Company wants these Pokémon to be special for the anime, for the merchandise, and for your team. This set has decent variety in their body types, with a biped that walks, a biped that flies, and a pinniped that swims. But again, they lean more towards humanoid, more towards role and personality than towards creature. The serious, cool, and funny personalities here are very obvious, and the final stages also have very human-centric roles, the archer, the wrestler, and the singer. But at least Generation 6 and 7 made great starter Pokémon. Yeah, they lean a little bit more humanoids than previous generations, but they do still retain some animalistic qualities, the families develop in interesting ways, and as a set, they do still offer a variety of choices. That was not the case in Generation 8. For starters, we're back to playing 
plain types, no exciting type combos anymore. The progressions are not very exciting. Grooky goes from drumming monkey to drumming ape. Scorebunny goes from kicking rabbit to better kicking rabbit. At least Sobble's growth from shy child to emo teen to secret agent is really good. The theme of wanting to be invisible carries through perfectly. They do get cool signature moves, eventually they got Gigantamax forms, and their hidden abilities are also really cool, especially Libero and Grassy Surge. But then they are, again, all offense-oriented. A balanced physical attacker, a speedy physical attacker, and a special glass cannon. And where they really suffer is that they are extremely centered on their roles. They are job mons, as my friend Quent calls them. The drummer, the soccer player, and the secret agent. And because their roles are very human, their designs end up very human too. When the least humanoid design you have is the gorilla, you know you've gone too far. Here's what I take from all of this history. A successful starter Pokemon has to be unique, and not only in the way they look as acknowledged in Game Freak's principle number one. They also have to be unique in their inspirations. A theme that is too cohesive doesn't leave room for the individual Pokemon to stand out. And in how they play. Stats, abilities, types, and signature moves all play into that. That is especially true when compared to previous starter Pokemon, and even more when compared to the other starter options in their set. Most people who dislike Ambor don't necessarily dislike its design, they dislike that it's the third mixed attacking firefighting starter in a row. Most people who dislike the Gen 8 starters don't dislike them because they are individually bad designs, although I do think that they are, but because they are a homogenous set. Variety is very important. At the time that I'm making this video, we don't have much information about Sprigatito, Fuecoco, and Quaxley, and no information at all about their evolutions. We do know that the first stages have very broad appeal, that their types and concepts are very well integrated, and that they have really individual personalities, as described on the official website. They have a lot of potential. But Sprigatito has been the focus of all of the conversation. A lot of people don't want to see it go bipedal, and I can completely understand that. If Sprigatito evolves into something bipedal, it will be like Tepic, like Fennekin, like Litten, a quadrupedal starter that ends up bipedal. The repetition would be especially obvious when compared to Litten, since it would be two cat-inspired starters in a row that start on all fours and end up on two. Sprigatito is also the only Gen 9 starter that is quadrupedal to begin with, so if it doesn't stay that way, it will reduce the body type variety of the set. Variety that is already historically missing. Until Generation 5, there was always one quadrupedal final stage starter. There hasn't been one since. Primarina has been the only fully evolved starter since Generation 5 to not be bipedal. But, Sprigatito going bipedal doesn't have to be the end of the world. We have two other starters to work with, right? Fuecoco and Quaxley both start on two feet, but so did Oshawa and Snivy, and they ended up on four and no feet. Maybe Fuecoco will go quadrupedal. Personally, I prefer Pokemon that retain a healthy dose of animalistic, so I do hope that Sprigatito stays on all fours. A quadrupedal, cat-like, fully evolved starter would be awesome. But even if it doesn't, as long as it still has a decent balance of human and animalistic, it could work pretty well, as it did in Generation 6 and 7. We just can't have a theme that pushes them all to end up looking the same. The variety is what I think is key to a really good set of starters. If Sprigatito goes bipedal, it will feel pretty repetitive to me, but as long as the other ones evolve in ways that compensate for that, we could still end up with a solid group of starters that everyone can be happy with. Yeah, right. Can you imagine actually <laughs> pleasing everyone? <laughs> In Pokemon? <laughs> Thank you for watching. I hope that I didn't miss any elements of starter Pokemon that you think are key, and if I did, let me know in the comments. And definitely tell me, what is your stance on Sprigatito's stance? This video was brought to you by the patrons and YouTube channel members who support this channel, including luxury patron Ethan from Chicago, Freebird Nerd who increased her contribution for this month, and my newest patron, Jet Set Spy. You are all awesome. If you want to join them, you can head to patreon.com slash but either way, I will see you in the next chapter.